Thank you very much uh, to the organizers of the conference uh, for giving me the uh, opportunity to speak here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some, some recent work uh, that was described in, in these papers. And um, the, basic, uh, the basic goal will be to explain uh, how soft theorems of, of uh, amplitudes in Yang Mills and gravity uh, can be understood from the point of view of a two-dimensional conformal field theory and how this gives new insights into uh, asymptotic symmetries of the S matrices of these theories and, and also uh, some insights into, into loop corrections of the soft theorems. So let me just begin uh, by defining what soft theorems are. Um, the idea is to consider an endpoint amplitude and then take the energy of one of the legs to go to zero. Uh, so in the case of uh, of gravity, uh, if you suppose that um, leg n is a graviton and you take its energy to go to zero, uh, what people have found over, over some decades uh, is that you are left with an n minus one point amplitude times some prefactor, uh, which is universal in the sense that its uh, structure doesn't really depend on the species of the other particles uh, which are participating in the scattering amplitude. And uh, you can write out this universal prefactor as a Taylor expansion uh, in powers of the soft momentum and the leading term in the Taylor expansion was found by Weinberg back in 1965. And since then, uh, various people have found a sub-leading correction and a sub-sub-leading correction. Uh, notably, Kachazo and Strominger computed this uh, sub-sub-leading term, S S1. And um, you could ask, what about higher order corrections? Uh, and and um, th those are less well understood, but what one can say is that in the holomorphic soft limit, so in other words, if you talk about uh, momentum in four dimensions, uh, which you can write in, in bi-spinner form, and then you implement the soft limit by taking one of these spinners to zero while holding the other one fixed. So in that holomorphic soft limit, uh, the higher order terms are suppressed. In other words, uh, the leading, subleading, and sub-subleading terms are singular, whereas higher order terms are finite. And furthermore, there is an analogous story uh, for, for Yang-Mills theory. So for a color-ordered Yang-Mills amplitude, if you take uh, leg n, the, the gluon at, at uh, position n, uh, to its energy to go to zero, uh, you get a, sub, uh, a leading soft term and a subleading soft term. And uh, I should say that, that at the subleading order and sub-subleading order, uh, you, you'll notice the uh, that, that the terms actually depend on this angular momentum generator, J, uh, which you can basically split into two pieces, one that encodes orbital angular momentum and one that encodes spin angular momentum. Oh, well, spin. Very good. And, and so... Uh, why, why there's recently been a revival of interest uh, in this subject is because uh, Strominger and, and collaborators uh, have, have sort of provided a new point of view or a new interpretation uh, for the soft theorems as being associated with certain, uh, well, being, basically the point was that, that one should think of them as being word identities associated with some spontaneously broken uh, infinite dimensional symmetry uh, which acts at null infinity. And this symmetry is known, known as BMS, or Bondi, uh, Van der Berg, Messner, and Sachs uh, symmetry. And, and just to illustrate how it works, let me draw the conformal diagram uh, for Minkowski space. Uh, and, and the edges of this diagram correspond to null infinity, in particular the two top edges of the, di uh, of the diamond correspond to future null infinity. The two bottom edges correspond to past null infinity. And, and roughly you can think of um, the BMS transformations uh, in, in, as, as being in, uh, coming in two forms. Um, well, I should say, first of all, uh, that, that uh, one, one can think of, the, um, of, of null infinity as, a, as being sort of a, a two-sphere times, times a null direction, at least it has, it's topologically a two-sphere times a null direction, and, and so one can parameterize the null direction of future null infinity uh, by this parameter u, so u sort of just uh, parameterizes this line here, and the null direction at past null infinity can be parameterized with the parameter v, and then the two-sphere can be parameterized uh, by a complex coordinate uh, z and uh, z bar. And, um, and, and, and so coming back to, to the point I was about to make, one can think of two types of um, BMS transformations. Uh, notably those which uh, translate you along this null direction, uh, which are known as uh, super translations. Um, in, in a special case, they just correspond to um, ordinary space-time translations. Uh, but more generally, you can allow these translations along the u-direction to depend in an arbitrary way on the coordinates of the two-sphere at null infinity. And, and that's why one speaks of it as being a super-translation. It has nothing to do with supersymmetry. It's just a historical, historical uh, accident that it was named that way. 
And, and also, uh, one consider, can consider global conformal transformations of, of the two-sphere at null infinity. Uh, it's also possible to extend uh, these global transformations to local conformal transformations, and in that case, one speaks of uh, the extended BMS group. Now, uh, coming back to, um, to Strominger's uh, conjecture, uh, the idea was that, in, in, in principle, one could act uh, with BMS transformations at future and past null infinity independently. But one needs to identify them in order, for example, to have uh, conservation of energy. Um, and, and in fact, um, BMS symmetry implies something much stronger than conservation of energy, uh, because it implies conservation of energy uh, at every angle on the two-dimensional sphere. So in other words, if I, if I uh, inject some energy at some point on the two-sphere at null, past null infinity, uh, I should uh, get back the same amount of energy at the same point on the two-sphere at future null infinity. And uh, with this identification of BMS transformations at past and future null infinity, uh, the conjecture was that, that they should essentially commute with the S matrix, with the gravitational S matrix. So in other words, if I act with a BMS transformation at past null infinity, then I multiply that by the S matrix, or if I multiply, if I first act with the S matrix and then multiply by a BMS transformation at future null infinity, uh, the difference of these two objects uh, should be zero. So in other words, all the matrix elements of this, uh, of this operator should vanish. And, and sort of the key idea uh, that, that led Strominger to make this conjecture uh, was the following. So, so as I said, BMS symmetry implies local conservation of energy. But of course, in, the, in a given scattering process, uh, conservation is sh sh shouldn't be conserved locally, right? I mean, after all, in a scattering process, the particle could get deflected. Uh, but the point is that, that what, what compensates for that deflection, what, what sort of um, uh, imposes the local conservation of energy, is the production of soft gravitons. So, so, so the basic physical picture is that during a scattering process, particles will get deflected, but at the same time, uh, you will have uh, the production of soft gravitons uh, whose total energy sums to zero, but whose local energy is, could be positive or negative in such a way that, that the energy along every given angle is conserved. And, and another way of looking at it uh, is that one should think of the BMS, trans, uh, BMS transformations as being spontaneously broken by the Minkowski vacuum. And, and so when one acts on, on, on uh, in-state or an out-state with a BMS transformation, uh, what, that actually produces a Goldstone boson. And, and the soft gravitons should be thought of as the Goldstone bosons associated uh, with that spontaneously broken symmetry. Uh, so, so very concretely, for example, let, let's, let's focus about, on super translations, right? So if I act with a super translation at past null infinity on an in state, uh, what I get back is, is a sum over the energies of, of the states, of the incoming states, weighted by this uh, function f, z, uh, f, z, and, uh, f of z and z bar, which is in principle an arbitrary function on the two-sphere. That's sort of that arbitrary function that parameterizes the super translation that I mentioned before. And in the case where f is just a constant, that just corresponds to global space-time translations. And, and so, of course, the, the Hamiltonian associated with a global time translation is just, uh, well, well the, it just corresponds to the energy of the particle. And so it's not surprising that you get a sum over energies. But on the other hand, you also get the insertion of a soft graviton. And, and that's, that's what's, uh, what, what I denote by f minus. Similarly, if I, if I act on an out state, with the super translation acting on future null infinity, once again, I get a sum over the energies of the outgoing states weighted by some function f, uh, as well as an insertion of, of a soft graviton at future null infinity. And then the key point is that when, when you uh, plug those expressions uh, into the word identity over here, you can massage it uh, in, into, into the following form, where on the left-hand side, uh, you have a matrix element involving the insertion of a soft graviton, and on the right-hand side, you just have an ordinary uh, S matrix element without any soft graviton insertions times some interesting looking prefactor, which after uh, sufficient massaging just just boils down uh, to the um, soft to the soft prefactor in Weinberg's uh, soft graviton theorem. Very good. Um, so, so in fact, uh, Strominger and collaborators uh, also conjectured that, that the sub sub well sorry that the subleading soft graviton theorem should be associated, uh, perhaps 
uh, with the extended BMS group, in other words, with, with local conformal transformations on the two-sphere. And also they've made similar conjectures uh, for soft theorems in, in Yang-Mills theories. And, and ultimately the picture that, 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 that they propose is that somehow one should think about uh, these soft theorems as being associated with ward identities uh, of some two-dimensional CFT, which lives on this two-sphere at null infinity. And so what I'd like to describe in this talk is a concrete realization of this picture. In particular, what I'd like to propose is that the ambi-twister string in four dimensions can be thought of uh, as, as this 2D CFT. And uh, so by, by now, uh, I, I think people may be almost saturated with discussions of the scattering equations. Uh, but, but let me just, just review it uh, very, very briefly. Um, so so the, the, sort of the two main ingredients, or at least one of the main ingredients that, that goes, uh, that led to the development of ambi-twister string theories uh, was, was uh, uh, the discovery of the scattering equations, uh, which were actually discovered uh, some time ago in the context of, of uh, scattering of tensionless strings by Gross and Mende, and what they found was in that limit, uh, one, one could evaluate uh, the courts correlators of, of vertex operators in string theory using a saddle point approximation, and they found that the uh, vertex operators basically become localized onto solutions of this equation, uh, where sigma i corresponds to the uh, point on the Riemann sphere corresponding to the ith vertex operator, and case ki is the uh, momentum of the ith external state, which is taken to be null because we're going to a tensionless limit. Uh, and and this, th this can really just be thought of as solving these equations is, is really just equivalent to solving uh, two-dimensional electrostatics. So in particular, you can just think of sigma i and sigma j as being the positions of, of point charges uh, on the Riemann sphere, and you can think of ki.kj as sort of being, being the product of their electric charges. And so uh, what, what this equation is basically telling you is that the electric field at the point i due to all the other points is canceling out. And, and what's remarkable is that uh, just a few years ago, Kachazo, He, and Yuan found that exactly the same uh, amplitudes arise in the context of ordinary field theories, by which I mean uh, uh, Yang-Mills theory and, 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 uh, and gravity, uh, without any supersymmetry and defined uh, in, in, in any dimension. And um, th th this, is, this is somewhat surprising. Uh, and, and what it strongly suggests is that even, even ordinary Yang-Mills and, and, and gravity uh, should have some kind of a uh, world sheet description. And, and this world sheet description uh, was, was realized at least for 10-dimensional uh, supergravity um, by, by uh, Mason and Skinner. And, and their model goes by the name of ambi-twister strings. And, and uh, people have already explained, explained this theory very nicely. So let, let me uh, just point out again some very basic features of the model. Uh, notably, the, 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 the fields are, are holomorphic. In other words, uh, everyone is either left-moving or right-moving. And, and you also have uh, this Lagrange multiplier constraint, which essentially enforces that all of the, all of the uh, uh, states are, are massless. And, and um, what, what's remarkable is that the correlation functions of this model precisely reproduce uh, the CHY formulae, as was demonstrated uh, in, in, in David's talk. And, and furthermore, uh, one, one can show that it's critical in D equals 26 for the Bosana case and D equals 10 for the superstring case. And the central charge counting works very similarly to the, uh, to, to, uh, the RNS string. But, but a crucial difference between this model and the RNS string uh, is, is that whereas in the RNS string one has 10-dimensional uh, ten, supergravity plus, plus an infinite tower of massive modes, uh, the claim is that this model has, the spectrum of this model contains only, math, only field theory degrees of freedom and no infinite tower. Now, what I'd like to focus on in this talk uh, is, is the version of this model in four dimensions. And in four dimensions, uh, one has a genuinely, well, uh, a more standard twistorial description, um, where, where, where the twisters, they, they take, on, uh, take on this form. You, so, so you have, uh, they're in general, uh, they have four bosonic components, uh, lambda and mu. Lambda can be thought of as, as uh, this lambda appearing in, in the uh, bi-spinner decomposition of a null momentum. Uh, and, and mu is, is sort of related to lambda by, by what are called incidence relations. And in addition to the twister z, you also have the twister w, uh, which can be thought of as the canonical conjugate of z. And, 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 and really the key point, uh, or the key property of, of, of this 4D ambi twister space is that uh, it's a non-chiral superspace. So in other words, one has both theta tilde 
and, and theta, what has both z and w. And, and this is a very important property because ultimately it allows one uh, to associate uh, positive helicity particles to z, for example, and negative helicity particles to w. And, and uh, ultimately this leads to a big, big simplification in, in the amplitudes that one obtains by computing the correlation functions in this theory. Just because the degree of, of the, the MHV degree of the amplitude will, will be encoded in the number of positive helicity vertex operators versus the number of negative helicity vertex operators rather than the degree of, of the curve uh, uh, and twister space which, which the uh, world sheet is being mapped to. So in other words, there will be many, many fewer integrals to do. Uh, and, and so, so let, me, uh, let, let me just uh, describe, describe this model in, in a little bit more detail. So, so for the models that, that describe uh, Yang-Mills theory, uh, the, action, the, the Lagrangian is, z, is just z d bar w, uh, and you also have this constraint imposing that z dot w is zero. Uh, for the models that, that describe gravity, um, it's, it's a very similar action, except that now you also have um, fermionic degrees of freedom on the world sheet, rho and rho tilde, um, whose, whose purpose is essentially uh, to give rise to determinants, uh, which is sort of the analog of the Park-Taylor factor in, in Yang-Mills theory. And, and one also gauges uh, this, this set of currents, uh, four of which are bosonic, four of which are fermionic. And another crucial difference uh, between this model, I mean, I, I should say that this model is, is very closely related to, to uh, the twister string theories of Berkowitz, Witten, and Skinner, but, but a crucial difference is that uh, one takes the fields in this model to be world sheet spinners. And again, this, this leads to, to various important simplifications, which I won't have time to describe in detail. Uh, but also, let, let me describe uh, what, what the vertex operators in this model look like. Uh, so, so for Yang-Mills theory, uh, basically what you have is a wave function in twister space. So that e to the i t dot uh, mu, mu dot lambda i, it, it can essentially be thought of as, an e, as a plane wave, an e to the i k dot x. The delta squared uh, enforces that, that the uh, plane wave is on shell. Uh, and you also have this current algebra J. So, so it, it obeys this Katz-Moody algebra. And um, th this, this term in the Katz-Moody algebra is essentially what gives rise to the Park-Taylor formula. So, so in other words, when you compute correlation functions of these vertex operators, the Park-Taylor terms will, will come, from, come from here. And typically, one neglects, neglects uh, this term over here uh, because that would lead to multi-trace terms. Uh, and, and uh, for, for gravity, uh, th there's a similar story. Again, you have, you have a wave function uh, on twister space, but, but now you have, you have a somewhat more interesting, uh, well, you have a somewhat different uh, structure appearing here, and in, in particular, you'll, you'll notice the appearance of the world sheet fields rho and rho tilde, which when you compute their correlation functions give rise to a, essentially the determinant of the Hodges matrix. So I, I, didn't, I, I should have mentioned this, that, that essentially the analog of the Park-Taylor formula for gravity uh, is, was, was found by Andrew Hodges, and, and, and uh, it's essentially a determinant of, of what's called the Hodges matrix. And uh, schematically, uh, if I want to compute an n to the k minus 2 mhv amplitude, uh, I do that by computing uh, the correlation function in the world sheet theory consisting of k negative helicity vertex operators and k minus n positive helicity vertex operators. The negative helicity guys can be obtained by, from these just by complex conjugation. Good. And, and so uh, what was shown previously is that uh, the, the correlation functions of, of, of these models indeed reproduce the tree-level amplitudes of, of super yang mills theory and supergravity uh, in, in four dimensions with any amount of supersymmetry. Uh, so in particular, n equals zero as well as uh, maximal supersymmetry. Uh, but what I'd like to, t to turn to now actually are, not, are, um, are, are how one understands the soft theorems using this four-dimensional model. And again, the, the idea is very simple. So what I'd like to claim is that uh, somehow the 4D ambi-twister model makes, makes, first of all, the derivation and the interpretation of the soft theorems completely transparent. And, and the reason is as follows. From, from the point of view of, of 4D ambi-twister string, a soft limit is understood simply by taking a vertex operator and a correlation function to go soft. Uh, and, and what one does is simply to tailor expand uh, this vertex operator in powers of the soft momentum. And then every term in the Taylor expansion uh, can be thought of as a charge which gives rise to a soft theorem when inserted into correlation functions. And, and I should say that, that a similar, a similar uh, approach uh, was, was, was uh, pursued by, by Adamo, Casali, and Skinner uh, using not the 4D MB twister string but a closely related model. So, so let, me, let, me go into some, let me provide some details about how, how this is realized. Uh, so the first step 
is, is uh, to, to express the delta functions which appear in a soft vertex operator uh, as contour integrals. And this is possible because the vertex operators of, of the ambitwister string have a, have a very beautiful property, notably they're holomorphic. Uh, so, so in particular, what you can do is the following. You can take this delta function, which appears in, in a soft vertex operator, and then you can decompose it in, into two delta functions by, by multiplying by this reference spinner, C. And then uh, this delta function can, can be written uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a derivative. Uh, so, so the, the reason why you get this delta function is essentially from the holomorphic anomaly that you get when you get uh, when you uh, take the derivative of del bar of, of one over z. So th this is uh, essentially how it arises. But then, because the rest of the integrand is holomorphic, you can essentially use uh, Stokes theorem to convert to convert this vertex operator uh, into a contour integral. And, and this is a very very important feature. So, so in particular, ultimately, what you can do. Uh, using these manipulations is to write uh, the yang mills and, and gravity vertex operators that I, that, uh, that, I, that I show you on previous slides uh, as contour integrals. And then from this point of view, uh, the soft theorems are just realized as residue theorems. So in particular, the idea is that, that uh, for example, in, in, in GR, once you've written uh, your soft, soft vertex operator as a contour integral, you just integrate it around each of the hard, well, you integrate around each of the vertex operators corresponding to a hard particle, compute the OPE, it's, and, and, and then compute the residue associated with each of these integrals, add up the residues, and then each term in the residues just corresponds to each term in the sum over hard particles that appeared in, 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 in the uh, expressions for the soft theorems. And, and for, for a color-ordered Yang-Mills amplitude, if you suppose that, that particle I is going soft, then you simply integrate the soft vertex operator around the locations of the two adjacent hard vertex operators, and that, that it, in a very elementary way, it's, it's just a simple uh, residue calculation, you, you, you uh, immediately obtain the soft theorems. In fact, Sorry, the, the yeah. leading soft, uh, uh, are you talking about the leading soft? Or, or I'm going to get to that right now, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this was about leading? No, no, this is everything. Or just, or this is everything in principle. So, so in fact, what you get naively uh, is an infinite series uh, of, of soft theorems. So, so, uh, I, can, I can just go ahead and, and compute these residues, and then I get, for example, uh, in Yang-Mills, I get uh, an exponential. Uh, with, and and uh, also, also for, for GR, I, I just get, get something in, in the form of an exponential, and then when I Taylor expand it, you find that the leading term corresponds to the leading soft theorem, the subleading term corresponds to the subleading soft theorem, and then for gravity, the sub-subleading term corresponds to the sub-subleading soft theorem, and you may ask, okay, well, you know, what about higher order terms? Is this giving you a, so, so somehow an infinite set of soft theorems? And that's, of course, too good to be true. Uh, but it turns out that similar expressions can also be obtained uh, using BCFW. And, and it's interesting to compare. And those can also be written in an exponential form. And it's interesting to compare the two sets of formulas that you obtain from the Abbey twister string uh, and, and from BCFW. And when you do that, you find uh, that, that they agree. For example, you find that the uh, soft for, for, for gravity, they agree precisely up to sub-subleading order, and for Yang-Mills, they agree precisely up to subleading order, and, uh, and and so this this makes you believe that that for higher orders, probably uh, probably this this um, the, the, these equations break down. And I've actually checked it explicitly, for example, in, in Yang-Mills for the six point. Uh, the thing you get at sub-subleading order is is not correct. Well, not, not the way it breaks down. Well, yes, yes. So, so, so I, I have. I, so, uh, all right. So, so what I should say is that actually, for BCFW, for MHV, it's trivially correct. Yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah. but, yeah. But, but, what happens here actually is that there was an approximation that I made when I computed these things. So, so I. So, let me tell you what that approximation was. The approximation was uh, that that I I was I said that I was free to take my soft vertex operator and essentially move it wherever I want. In other words, to integrate it around all the hard guys. But in fact. Uh, that, that's only true in the limit that, that the uh, momentum of the soft vertex goes to zero, because in that limit, uh, the scattering equations for the hard vertex operators no longer see it, no longer see the soft vertex operators, because the, the term in those scattering equations is proportional to the momentum of the soft vertex operator. So it's only true in that limit uh, that, 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 I, that somehow the, uh, 
the, the location of the hard vertex operators somehow no longer care or see about the location of the soft vertex operator. But of course, uh, that, that's an approximation. And in fact, the higher order terms in the soft theorem should be derivable by taking into account the back reaction of the soft, soft vertex operator on, onto the hard, hard vertex operators. So, so that's, that's my way of seeing it in, in this context. Good. Um, right. Uh, so so what, I, what I've tried to argue is that the soft theorems uh, from, from the point of view of the 4 dmv twister string uh, correspond to word identities associated with charges that can simply be obtained uh, by expanding soft vertex operators. And if you want to see what these charges look like very explicitly, I write them down here. So, so for example, for Yang-Mills, uh, you, you get the following infinite set of vertex operators, and for, for gravity, you get uh, these two sets of infinite, ver uh, infinite sets of vertex operators. And, and what I've claimed on the previous slide is that up to sub-leading order in Yang-Mills, so, so the, the, sorry, the, the leading order soft theorem is just, cor just corresponds to Q minus one Yang-Mills. The leading order soft theorem corresponds to Q zero Yang-Mills. Uh, and, and similarly for, for, for gravity, uh, the leading order <laughs> term corresponds to Q minus one, the sub-leading order corresponds to Q zero, and the sub-sub-leading order corresponds to Q zero. And, and there's a very, very, uh, curious, uh, curious property of, of these charges uh, that you notice after you stare at them sufficiently, which is that you can actually map the Yang-Mills charges into the GR charges simply by replacing this current algebra with this object. And at the level of OPEs, uh, this object has a very nice interpretation. So, so to understand that, first remember that the coordinates uh, mu and lambda tilde are canonically conjugate in the world sheet theory. So in other words, uh, I can, I can uh, express mu simply as d, d by d lambda tilde when I compute OPEs with other vertex operators. And, and so uh, making that replacement, you see that the right-hand side just corresponds to a Lorentz generator. So in other words, I, I just have something like this. d lambda alpha dot uh, d by d lambda tilde beta dot symmetrized. Uh, here, s corresponds to the spinner of the soft momentum. So, so I have uh, lambda s alpha dot lambda s beta dot. And on the other hand, uh, when I compute OPEs of j with the other j's, uh, keeping the single trace term, that gives me a structure constant, f a b c. So, so the point is that, that uh, at least up to sub-leading order, a sub-sub-leading order in gravity, you can obtain uh, the, ver the, the, the charges that generate uh, gravitational soft theorems from the charges that generate Yang-Mills soft theorems, essentially by replacing a, a, a Lie algebra structure constant uh, with the Lorentz generator. And, and this smells like color kinematics duality, but, but uh, I think it would be interesting to understand that in, in greater detail. Uh, th there's one other, th there, there's another interesting uh, part of the story, which is that using the 2D, uh, 2D CFT point of view, you can also start asking questions about the algebra of soft limits. So, so just to be very, very concrete, consider the, the commutator of two consecutive soft limits. So in other words, suppose I take particle n minus 1 soft, and then I take particle n to be soft. So using the picture I just described, if I take particle n soft, then I'll get a circle around all the other vertex operators, a blue circle. But then when I take particle n soft, I get a green circle uh, around the particles. And then, of course, I can do that in the opposite direction, in the, in the opposite uh, order, and, and then I take the difference of the two. So, so these pictures are supposed to represent sort of what's going on from the point of view of the, of the world sheet theory. And then it's, it's very natural to discard... So, so, then one observes the following. There are two types of contributions. Those which involve a circle, uh, uh, a dot with two circles around them, and those which involve a dot with one circle around them. And it's very natural to just throw away the, 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 the contributions which correspond to a, a dot with one circle around them. Uh, and, and one can explicitly do that simply by choosing the reference spinners of the soft vertex operators so that they're equal to the... Uh, so, so in other words, the reference spinner for the n minus one particle you said equal to the momentum spinner of the nth particle, and vice versa. And the reason why that's a nice thing to do is because after throwing away these so-called boundary contributions, which correspond to one soft vertex operator sort of looping around the other one before it comes soft, uh, all you have left are contributions involving uh, dots with two circles around them, but, but in the opposite order. And then you recall that in, in 2D CFT, uh, these contour integrals can also be written in term, as, as commutators. right? And so what the left-hand side of this equation shows is that it can be just written as, as these, the difference of these two nested commutators. But then, this looks something like something very familiar. This is just the Jacobi identity. So, so using the Jacobi identity, you see that I can just, I can just obtain 
this commutator of consecutive soft limits by just taking the OPE of my two vertex operators, which gives me a new charge, and then that new, new charge, when I insert it into a correlator of n minus two hard vertex operators, will automatically give me uh, the, the, the commutator of, 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 uh, of the soft limits. And, and so uh, ultimately what, what this allows you to see is that the commutator of soft limits can be encoded in the OPE of, of vertex operators. Or in other words, the algebra of soft limits can be encoded in the algebra of surf soft vertex operators. So okay, let's go back to, our, to, to, to the expression for, for these charges. So for example, at leading order uh, in, 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 in gravity, uh, that corresponds to L being minus 1. This term involving the mu just, just goes away, so there are no derivatives. Right? And what I'm left with is just, just, uh, an, just an object written in terms of spinners without derivatives. So it's clear that, that, when, that at leading order, all the charges correspond, uh, that they just commute. It's, it's, just an abelian, it's just an abelian algebra. And, and that's consistent uh, with, with uh, Strominger's conjecture that, that the um, symmetries associated with, with uh, the leading soft graviton theorems are, are, are abelian and notably um, super translations. But then something interesting happens at subleading order. So let's go back to our charges. Now at subleading order, now, now this guy involving the mu turns on, so I'm going to have a derivative. And, and so now, uh, when I t compute the OPs of these subleading vertex operators, uh, the algebra is non-abelian, and in fact it generates an infinite, infinite dimensional uh, set of vertex operators. Uh, and it's not difficult to see that it's actually a, a great, uh, an infinite dimensional graded algebra, where the grading corresponds to the power of the soft momentum. And, um, well, sorry, that, that's in general, but, but okay, sorry, let, let me just go back to the subleading case. So, so in the subleading case, uh, you find this infinite dimensional algebra, it contains the global conformal symmetry group, uh, but, but beyond that, I, 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 I don't see any sign of Birasoro symmetry, and one way to, to note it is that uh, these, these generators aren't holomorphic, they depend on lambda and lambda tilde, whereas Virasoro generators are typically written, uh, should be, it should be possible to write them in a holomorphic way. Uh, I mean, of course, that doesn't mean it's not Virasoro. It could correspond to some very non-obvious representation of Virasoro. But, but af after uh, playing around with it for a long time, uh, one, one just doesn't find any, any, uh, any a hint of it. And in fact, uh, what one finds is that by commuting these, op you know, by taking nested commutators of, of these subleading vertex operators, you can essentially generate arbitrary number of poles in lambda and lambda tilde. And so what, what the, the picture that you get is somehow that the diffeomorphisms associated uh, with, 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 these, um, with the subleading vertex operators should somehow correspond to, uh, uh, in principle, arbitrary diffeomorphisms of the two-sphere if, if you interpret lambda as corresponding to a homogeneous coordinate of the two-sphere, except that they're not arbitrary. So, so there is one, one constraint, uh, uh, at least one constraint that I, that, that I can prove, uh, which is that, uh, it, in general, for one of these diffeomorphisms, uh, it, 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 it always satisfies the following, the sa the following equation d by d lambda tilde, delta lambda tilde is equal to zero. Well, delta lambda and delta lambda tilde are just correspond to the diffeomorphisms I obtain uh, by taking arbitrary nested commutators. So, so they always obey this very simple constraint. And this is very reminiscent of, it's, it sort of looks like you're, you're, you're setting the Jacobian of, some, of something to one uh, in, in a way. So, so I, I'm tempted to say that, that these are area preserving, but, but I, I, I haven't really managed, managed to show that. But um, I, I think, I think what, what, I, what I'd like to say at least is that, that at least from the point of view of the 4D MB twister string, uh, the underlying symmetry of, of the subleading soft graviton theorems is far, far more general than Virasoro. So Virasoro doesn't seem to be playing a, 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 an essential role. And, and there are other hints of this, notably uh, that one can define, of course, these subleading soft theorems in arbitrary dimensions, whereas Virasoro is something very special uh, to the two-sphere. Good. Uh, and, and so I, I should say that there's more to this than just pictures and words. So, so, so one can uh, verify this, this picture using explicit field theory calculations. And then this was, this was carried out uh, by this group here. I don't know if, it's, if I should go through all the details, but the point is that if you compute, you can just explicitly compute the cons, uh, commutator of consecutive soft limits, and after sufficient massaging, you get this very compact answer. And, and at the same time, so, so this is from the field theory point of view, at the same time from the CFT point of view, it just corresponds to taking the OPE of, of certain charges, which I showed you on, on the previous slide, and when you compute their OPE, this is the charge you get, and it's precisely the type of charge, uh, it has precisely the structure that I showed on the previous slide. In particular, if I just 
plug this into a correlator of n minus two hard vertex operators, and I integrate it around each of the n minus two hard ones, and I add up the residues, I get precisely, precisely this, this formula here. Okay. Now, um, so, so this is all, all a tree level story. And, and so what I'd like to do, uh, what I'd like to describe next is how to understand uh, loop corrections uh, to the soft theorems. But even, even before that, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, ask the question, how do you compute, well, is it possible to compute loop amplitudes in this four-dimensional uh, ambi-twister string? And, and I mean, th this is a natural question for, for various reasons. Uh, as, as we've heard in, in, in several talks now, there's been tremendous, uh, you know, very impressive progress in, in understanding uh, well, loop amplitudes of 10-dimensional supergravity uh, using the ambi-twister point of view, which is, of course, interesting because 10-dimensional supergravity arises as the low energy limit of, of, uh, of a RNS string. Um, but, of course, uh, another very interesting uh, gravitational theory is N equals H supergravity, and, and uh, this audience uh, probably needs no convincing. So, so a very important open question is whether uh, N equals H supergravity is, is perturbatively finite, and, and this is a question uh, that was pioneered by this group of people uh, written above, uh, many of whom are in the audience, but by now I think there are many people uh, working on this subject from, from various points of view. And, and so uh, I, I think uh, because this, this theory has the possibility to be at least perturbatively finite, um, it would be interesting uh, and perhaps useful to have if, if there were also a world sheet description for n equals a supergravity. And, and, and so, as I already said, uh, the 4D ambi twister string at least computes the right amplitudes at tree level, for n equals 8 supergravity, so it's, it's, it seems like a good candidate uh, for, for such a world sheet description. So, so let's see how, how far we can get uh, with, with this point of view. So, so one, one immediate thing that you notice is, in fact, when you set the target space supersymmetry of this theory to be maximal, it becomes critical. So that, that's quite nice. But it only becomes critical if you don't gauge the world sheet Virasoro symmetry, which typically will introduce some central charge of minus 26. It's a little bit exotic, perhaps. Uh, but but what, what this is suggesting is that, uh, for, at least for the 4D ambi twister string, uh, gauging the Virasoro symmetry is, is not the natural thing to do. Uh, so, so then you can ask, okay, well, uh, do, does that lead to any kinds of problems? Uh, and, and what you can show, actually, is, is that uh, by imposing global conformal symmetry, so, uh, which, which doesn't require any gauge fixing, so, so in other words, if you just impose a global symmetry, that doesn't introduce any central charge of minus 26. So, so if you just impose global, global conformal symmetry, along with the other uh, eight, eight uh, uh, currents that I wrote, wrote down on a previous slide, that's actually powerful enough to remove all of the unphysical states. And, and so, so you, you might ask, well, how do you think about this? Uh, certainly in, 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 in the standard RNS string, when, when you um, quantize it in a covariant way, uh, what imposing the Virasoro symmetry uh, is, is very important because it removes all the negative norm states. On the other hand, uh, if you don't co quantize covariantly, for example, if you quantize in light cone gauge, so in other words, you just use the Virasoro symmetry to eliminate all the unphysical states, that is the long longitudinal degrees of freedom, then you're left uh, with, with a theory uh, that, that is, uh, has a manifestly positive definite Hilbert space, but, but somehow the Virasoro symmetry that, that sort of acts on, on the transverse degrees of freedom doesn't Im imply any more, any more constraints. It's in some sense an accidental, an accidental symmetry. And, and so that's, that's the point of view uh, that I'd like to propose, uh, is, is that one should think of the 4D ambi twister string as some, some kind of uh, uh, string theory in, in some analog of, of light cone gauge. But of course, uh, it's important to, to uh, make, make this idea more concrete. But that at least is, is, is what, what, what the theory is suggesting so far. Good. So, so if you accept this point of view, uh, then, then you, you, the next question to ask is, OK, well, what does it compute sensible loop amplitudes? And, and the answer seems to be yes. So, so uh, <coughs> excuse me, at one loop, I'm just going to define the loop amplitude to just be a correlation function uh, of, of L. Oh, well, OK, sorry. For, for an n to the k minus 2 mh v amplitude, I'll, I'll just take k negative felicity vertex operators, n minus k positive felicity vertex operators. I'm going to compute their correlation function on a torus. And then I'm just going to, by hand, integrate over the locations of all these vertex operators, as well as integrate over the, uh, the complex structure of the torus, which is a very, very physically sensible and natural thing to do. And, and so uh, it's, 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 not, it's not too difficult uh, to, to compute the correlation function. So the first thing you do is, is to um, 
So l let me just sketch it for you. So the first thing you do is to go back to your vertex operators here, right? And then you notice these exponentials. So, so you take, take the argument of these exponentials and you combine it with the action. Uh, and after doing that, uh, what you find is that the correlator is actually independent of the world sheet fields mu, mu, tilde, and chi, tilde. So I can integrate them out at the level of their equations of motion. And, and that implies, so sorry, I can just integrate them out of the path integral. And that implies the following equations of motion for the lambda, lambda, tilde, and chi fields. Okay? Same thing happens at, at tree level, I should say. But at loop level, something, something new happens, which is that the, the solutions to these equations is, is somewhat more, more non-trivial. So in particular, uh, uh, if, if you assume that these fields have periodic boundary conditions on the torus, then, then the, first of all, they can have zero loads. And, and uh, second of all, uh, the, the solutions are, are then, are the rest of the solution is just given by uh, uh, terms in, involving a Green's function on the torus uh, with, with, with periodic boundary conditions. And, and it's all, it also turns out that, that uh, these solutions can only exist if I also supply some kind of constraint on the residues. And in particular, uh, the, the, the sum of the residues uh, for each of, these, each of these fields vanishes when added up uh, on, on the torus. And, and then when you, what happens is that when you plug these, these solutions back into the delta functions of the vertex operators, that is what gives you the one-loop scattering equations uh, in four dimensions, but now refined by helicity. Okay? And, and so in the end of the day, uh, you obtain the following, following uh, one-loop one loop amplitude uh, uh, for... for uh, n equals 8 supergravity. So, so let, let me just uh, review the, the different parts of this, of this formula. So first of all, I have this, the, these delta functions. As I said, these, these just impose the four-dimensional one-loop scattering equations uh, refined by helicity. Uh, I also have an integral over the zero modes, lambda, t lambda zero, lambda tilde zero, eta zero. Okay? Uh, I have um, this, this sum over spin structures. I'm just going to restrict to even spin structure now for simplicity. Uh, I have the sum over spin structures, uh, which involves determinants. Uh, these determinants are essentially the generalization of, of, of the determinant of the Hodges matrix, but now, now to uh, one loop. So essentially what that means is that I replace all the tree-level Green's functions appearing in, in that object with loop-level Green's functions, which will depend on the spin structure. And I also have, have this, this uh, product of, of theta functions, uh, which can be thought of as a one-loop partition function, which one obtains from integrating out the fluctuations of, of the fields. And, and, the, and the sum over spin structures involves this minus 1 to the alpha. This imposes some analog of GSO projection uh, for, for this theory. Um, and um, let's see. So, so, so OK, good. So, so I should say that, that uh, there are certain uh, stru structures that are very similar to, to those which appear in the one-loop amplitude of the 10 DMB twister string, which have, uh, were, were nicely described by, by uh, uh, Eduardo. Uh, but, but there are also some crucial differences. Uh, so, so let me point out the crucial differences. So, so whereas in, in the 10D case, uh, one had this delta function, delta P squared, uh, which ultimately uh, just imposed that, that only massless particles can flow through factorization channels, uh, such a delta function doesn't appear in this formula because uh, P squared is automatically zero. Everything in this theory is, is, is on shell. So in other words, P is just equal to lambda tilde lambda, lambda, tilde, roughly speaking, so p squared is automatically zero. It's, somehow this constraint is just built into the formalism. That's one important point. Uh, the other po important point is in, for the 10D ambi twister string, uh, the delta functions localize not only the positions of the vertex operators, but they also determine uh, the values of the complex structure tau. Uh, but that's, that's not the case uh, in, in, in 4D. So in 4D, the delta functions only localize uh, the positions of the vertex operators, and one is left with four integrals in the end, an integral over tau and an integral over the zero modes. And, and actually, uh, that's very reminiscent of the type of integral that you obtain from computing uh, with on-shell diagrams. So, so at one loop, uh, in the on-shell diagram approach, typically what you get uh, is something like this, uh, dq over q uh, times an integral of an on-shell momentum, uh, lambda zero uh, d squared lambda zero over uh, GL1. And, and so you can see that, that this measure is mapped into that one uh, when you just replace tau with log of q. So in fact, uh, so somehow uh, if you want to map this on, onto the uh, 
type of loop amplitude you obtain in the on-shell diagram formalism, you should think of tau as corresponding to some kind of a, a BCFW shift. Except in this case, uh, the amplitude actually has, has, a, has a very nice property, notably that it's modular invariant. And that, that puts a, a uh, UV cutoff, essentially, on tau. So, so it's, it's, very, it's very tempting for me to say that the UV finiteness is, is manifest in, in this formula uh, because, because of this UV cutoff. But on the other hand, as, as, as uh, Eduardo and others pointed out, uh, it's, it's not completely obvious. Uh, it's a subtle question because one also has to think about uh, how the solutions of the scattering equations are, are behaving. But, but in general, I, I, I have the strong feeling that, that somehow this formulation should, should, make, should, should have better power counting behavior. At the very least, because somehow, uh, you know, string theory amplitudes, they encode, they package Feynman diagrams in a very nice way. And so the expectation is that uh, string amplitudes should have better, better, well, the sum of Feynman diagrams should have better power counting behavior than individual ones. And so for that reason, one would expect uh, that, that power counting should, should, should become better. Uh, from this point of view, but but it hasn't been it hasn't been established. You mentioned that uh, according to rations was a bit bit tau and three from the right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also have an integration over this uh, DPI. That that's fixed by the delta functions. The, those and the Zs and the Ts are right. 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 Yes. Mm -hmm. What about the current divergences? Good. Good. Excellent. So that's that, that's a perfect question because that's in my next slide. Okay. Yes. The other nice thing is that this thing uh, has the has the right. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's nothing. Yeah, I, I, I was just trying to say that, that you know somehow you, you want to integrate tau over the fundamental domain, and so 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 somehow that, that puts a cutoff on a, on the tau integral in the same way that you get a cutoff, you know, in, in the string in, in the string theory integral in, in, in you know in the string theory uh, case. So something. Yeah. But why do you integrate over the fundamental domain? Modular invariance. So but you don't. You have engaged world sheet gravity. Well, I mean the the well. Okay. Uh, I'm saying this is a natural thing to do because the thing is modular invariant. You could integrate over all the copies of it, but it seems that it doesn't seem natural to do so. But uh, okay, I, I mean, I, I admit that there, there. Well, normally, yeah. normally in string theory, what happens is uh, when you go alpha prime goes to zero, then uh, it gets pushed. You know, it gets pushed down. You know, since the cutoff is being removed, but there must, I said, there must be something analogous here. Is there, uh, yeah, there alpha prime. prime Alpha prime is already zero here. So. But do you have a dimensionful parameter of any kind in the theory? I would say just, just the coupling constant. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, at this point, no. But, but the, I think the subtlety is that, that uh, it's not obviously a good UV behavior because you have scattering equations in play. And so it's, once you take those into account, then, then I mean, I'm, without taking those into account, it's difficult, I'll difficult I'll to say. Okay, yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. So, so the answer is that uh, all, all that, that, that we've managed to check so far is that it has the right factorization properties. Uh, I, it would be very, very good to massage it in, into the box formula that hasn't been done. And, and it's, somehow the fact that it can be done at least in 10D using the, this nice trick of mapping, mapping the amplitude onto a two-sphere uh, suggests that it should be possible in this case. But, but somehow the structure of the, of the 10D one loop amplitude is, is quite different from the 4D amplitude. So it's not completely obvious how to implement it, but, but I, 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 would, I think there should be a way to do but it, but I haven't done it. Of course, doesn't have modular invariance. So so, sorry? The final answer doesn't... doesn't You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, what do you... It's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, this is suggestive. I, I don't... Uh, I, until you, you explicitly map it, it's difficult to say. I agree. I agree. I, I, all I want to point out is that somehow the, the, the structure is very different than in 10D, it seems. Okay, um, good. So, so then the question was, what, is, is what about IR limits? And, and in, in fact, the analysis of the, of the IR, IR behavior is, is quite similar to 10D. Uh, what, what, what's crucial in that analysis is that you have this GSO projection, uh, which essentially eliminates two of the spin structures and, and leaves you uh, with, with one of them, H2, I think, and depending on your notation. And, and uh, in that way, all of the potential uh, tachyonic poles are removed. And, and in, in a sense, ultimately what happens is that, uh, that, that uh, one, one takes imaginary part of tau to infinity, or, or, or equivalently, one takes uh, q to 0. And, and in that limit, uh, the integrand becomes rational. And, and, the re and, and the reason why it becomes rational is perhaps not difficult to see. 
uh, by, by recalling that in the IR limit, uh, what that corresponds to in, in the context of the world sheet is, uh, is a non-separating degeneration. So, so in that limit, the, the torus just degenerates to a two-sphere uh, with two additional punctures. So this is something that was already described very clearly. Um, so I won't, I won't go into too much detail uh, there. And, and, then, and then the interpretation is that, that uh, you have this on-shell state flowing, flowing, uh, flowing uh, through this tube uh, whose vertex operators I'll, I'll denote with uh, as A and B. And the momentum of, of that state is simply lambda, to, lambda zero, lambda tilde zero. That the, is the zero modes of, of, the, um, of the one loop that are being integrated over in, in the one loop amplitude. And, um, and then furthermore, the IR divergence comes from the limit that k goes to zero. And, and so in this limit, essentially, what, what happens is that you can obtain the integrand uh, from performing a double soft limit of, of a tree level amplitude with n plus two external particles. And uh, in the present context, it's actually more convenient to leave these vertex operators unfixed and to fix other ones. Uh, the, the reason why, I'll, I'll explain in a second. But how do you regulate this, though? I'll, I'll, go, I'll get there. I'll get there, yeah. So, yeah, I'll, 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 it's a great question. Yeah, I'll get there. In the end, it's kind of a cheat, but uh, is, is the answer. But, but uh, so, 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 okay, good. So, so now, now that we realize that in the IR limit, the IR divergent part of the integrand can be obtained from a double soft limit, we can apply all of the discussion that I described in the first part of the talk about soft limits. So in particular, you take these two vertex operators, VA and VB, and you take them to go soft. So you just write them as a contour integral, you tailor expand them, you keep the leading order terms. And, and then uh, the soft limit is simply obtained by integrating VA and VB around each, each, each pair of hard vertex operators. And so this just gives you a sum, sum over, over each pair of hard vertex operators. And this epsilon dot ki over k dot ki is essentially, is essentially uh, this, this term here, uh, where, where, where I've identified epsilon uh, with, 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 this, with, with this combination of the spinners using the standard spinner helicity formalism. So, so this just comes out from doing these residue calculations. And furthermore, the integral over the zero modes I can write in this, you know, vectorial notation sim as simply as d to the fourth k times delta k squared. That's just d squared lambda zero, d squared lambda tilde zero. So now that I've written it in this notation, what I do is I say, okay, well, I'm going to take four to four plus two epsilon. You know, when you're working in four dimensions, it's, it's an awkward thing. Uh, regularization is, is not an easy question. But, but in the end, what, what the, the point is that you just, you just uh, write, write your answer in a vectorial notation, and then the, it's, it's straightforward just to write it in d, d plus four. Uh, you know, four plus two epsilon dimensions. And, and what's nice is that th this integral is, is precisely the one that Weinberg obtained back in his, in, in his paper in 1965. Except back then, I don't think Dimreg was invented yet. So, so he, he actually uh, computed this integral using uh, cutoffs. Uh, but, but it can also be, be evaluated using Dimreg. And uh, that was uh, carried, out, <coughs> carried out by these people and, and also uh, er er earlier work. And, and what you obtain is just the standard standard IR, uh, IR divergence of, of uh, one loop IR divergence, right? So, so what you get back is a tree level amplitude, endpoint tree level amplitude, times this prefactor which encodes the IR divergence. Uh, you'll notice that there's only a one over epsilon here because all the double poles in epsilon cancel out by momentum conservation. And then uh, there's a very nice manipulation due to Byrne, Davies, and Null, which allow you to compute the one loop correction uh, to, this, uh, to the soft theorem simply by, by uh, taking, for example, particle n in this, in this amplitude to go soft and tailor it and, and, and then applying the soft theorem to the tree level amplitude and, and then uh, taking the soft limit of this expression. And after, uh, after some, some manipulations, what you find is that the uh, divergent, uh, sorry, the, the, the one loop correction to the uh, soft theorems due to IR divergences uh, can be written in this way. So in particular, what you find is that the leading order soft limit is not corrected uh, by not corrected by one loop at one loop, which is also uh, clear by dimensional analysis. Uh, but but the subleading soft theorem is is corrected, uh, and and it has the the following form. So I should just say that the from the ambi twister point of view, it, it gives a nice it gives a nice geometric interpretation for where these IR divergences are coming from. So just 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 to explain again, uh, this limp on shell momentum it just comes from taking the non -G, non uh, sorry. Uh, a non-factorizing uh, degeneration of the world sheet, and and these soft these products of soft factors just come from integrating uh, each end of the tube 
around each pair of hard vertex operators on the world sheet. It's a very, very simple and natural geometric description, which, which gives you the expected higher divergences. Okay, so I think at this point I'm, I'm basically out of time. So let me just summarize the, the, the main points uh, which, which I tried to make, uh, which are that, first of all, 4D ambitwister string theory provides new insight into soft theorems and symmetries of the gravitational S matrix. And, and uh, I think they may also provide in, in, interesting uh, new insights into loop amplitudes of n equals 8 supergravity. There are some positive, uh, positive uh, suggestions at, at one loop, but, but I think really, really the important question is, can you, can you write down a, a, a prescription uh, to, uh, that, at, at arbitrary genus? And um, I, I, th I think we have some ideas about how to do that, so, so I'm optimistic, but that remains to be seen. And of course, another important question is, can you actually see that these, that these loop amplitudes are field theoretic? Because uh, somehow you have the same problem that one had at some point in the Tendi case, where at first the, the loop integrands were written in terms of, of theta functions. Uh, but then um, th this group came up with a very, very clever and, and beautiful mechanism for, for, uh, for expressing that loop integrand uh, in, in a manifestly rational way. And, and, and I, would, I would hope that there's a similar type of manipulation that one can do uh, for, for the 4D case. But, but uh, yeah, that remains to be seen. So I, I think I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, well, the conjecture is that, that Vera Soro should be there. So, so I would say that, that uh, it, it's, it's not completely in agreement. Um, but I should say that, it, okay, I mean, in, in their proof, I, I think uh, there, were, there were some issues. So, so I think they could sort of, sort of show, so, show something in one direction but not the other. I don't recall, I don't recall the details. And then also, since that paper came out, there were other papers that analyzed the problem using a similar formalism and claimed that, in fact, there was some more general, general set of symmetries uh, at, at work. So, so I, I think uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an open question uh, as to what's, what, what the underlying symmetry of, of the subleading soft theorem is. And, and I'm tempted to say that, that somehow the fact that Vera Soros symmetry isn't playing a crucial role for the, for the soft limits and also doesn't seem to be playing a crucial role on the world sheet of the ambi twister string in 4D, I, I'm tempted to say that these may be related somehow. In particular, you might, might think of imposing some sort of a static gauge where you, where you uh, force the world sheet to live on this two-sphere and somehow identify uh, the symmetries of the world sheet with, with the symmetries acting on the two-sphere. But, but I, I should just say that this is all a vague, vague picture, so, so it, needs to be, it needs to be made more concrete. I, I'm sure I have just the wrong end of the state here, but uh, mm -hmm. so with the one-loop formula, is the claim that in the, in the non-separating degeneration, this zero mode of the, the zero mode of the Z and the W field are providing you with the on-shell momentum. And uh, so, so Z and W are meant to be taking values in K to the half? Uh, they, they are spin half, indeed. On, yeah, on the world so series. if they have a zero mode, that means they're in some odd spin structure? That's right, yeah, so I'm taking them to have, uh, to have uh, periodic boundary conditions, right. But, but okay, then you ask, well, where is the, where is the um, GSO projection coming from? Uh, because re remember that they're actually, okay, so, so there's Z and W, and there's also rho and rho tilde. Yeah. So it's these guys that, whose, whose uh, boundary conditions can be even or odd. And, and uh, it, it, yeah, and, and so the, the GSO, well, yeah, so, so that's where, where the uh, other boundary conditions can come in. Yeah, and, but, uh, I mean, uh, ordinarily, I wouldn't have expected anything that was living in an odd spin structure to survive in the Q goes to zero limit. Mm, well, I don't know. I don't see a fundamental reason of why not. And it seems very natural in a sense because somehow you want to have some loop momentum in the end, right? The loop well, momentum yeah, I mean, has, has, to, come, has to come from Z and W. So, so, I mean, maybe it's non-standard, but I, I think it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with it and it seems to, to, to be giving you uh, sensible answers. So. But, but again, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, somehow, right now, uh, one is just follow, you know, we're just following our nose and sort of doing what seems reasonable. I, 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 I do admit that, that you know, there are... You know, many, many details, I think, that, that need, need to be thought about carefully. But, but I, I, what I want to say is that somehow, at least in four dimensions, I, I think there's something interesting you can say at loop level, which, which deserves, deserves to be thought about. Hi, Krishna. So, uh, you 
you said in the beginning that in some sense some twisted string can be thought of as living like a null infinity. Mm -hmm. Did you explain it in your talk? I did not, yeah, yeah. So, so this was something I think that, that uh, that um, Tim <coughs> talked about a little bit. And, and the point is that there's a, an intimate relationship between ambi-twister space and null infinity. Uh, so you, you can basically you say that ambi-twister space is the cotangent bundle of null infinity. So, so for example, uh, Tim was talking about these fields lambda, lambda tilde, and uh, u, I think. Uh, so, so these can be constructed from, from the ambi-twister space. Uh, so, so, so u, for example, is just uh, something like lambda, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me think about this. So, so yeah. So it should be mu mu times uh, lambda tilde. Yeah. Maybe. No. Uh, whatever. Okay. So, so something like that. So the, the point is that all of these coordinates of null infinity that that, that Tim was uh, talking about the other day, they, they can be constructed from these ambi twister coordinates. And and for, in four dimensions, uh, it's particularly nice. It, it turns out that in general dimensions, if you want to map the ambi twister, if you want to relate the ambi twister space. To, um, to null infinity, in addition to having the fields uh, P and X, you have to introduce some auxiliary space, some, uh, U and, and, and W, which somehow is a scale factor. In, in four dimensions, somehow, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty direct. Yeah. It's P and X, and see that null infinity is just null over... Right, 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 yeah, yeah. So uh, well, well, yeah, so, so, so somehow you, you think of this as being the cotangent bundle of, 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 of null infinity. Of, um, of, of null infinity. So, so if in particular, you say that P and X are c canonically conjugate, and U and W are, are canonically conjugate. And, um, yeah, I, I didn't really need this, though, for in, in four dimensions, so I didn't want to talk about that too much. So. Any more questions?